We're now going to begin the second video presentation, and we're going to cover disorders now, musculoskeletal disorders of the elbow and forearm. And this is the point, again, where you may want to gather the lecture notes, perhaps print off the PowerPoint slides. We're going to cover basically two general categories. There aren't a lot of things that go wrong with the elbow and forearm, so we're going to cover two general categories, joint hypomobility and overuse syndromes. So we'll start with joint hypomobility, and I realize that this isn't really a disorder, and it's a symptom or an impairment. So we're kind of switching things around, it, and this is the approach that Kisner and Colby use, because we're going to see that when the joint is immobilized, there are really a set of common impairments and limitations, and there's a very common approach to management. So it encapsulates the material a little bit better, and it makes it a little bit easier for us to talk about. So when we look at the general category of joint hypomobility, we have to think about, well, why will, would the elbow be hypomobile? Either because we've immobilized it, or because there's been some pathology or trauma. So here we have uh, a clear pathology, uh, dislocation of the, of the humerus and the radius on the, on the, I'm sorry, of the ulna and the radius on the humerus. And this generally does occur with some form of trauma. Clearly, the person that would have to be repaired or reduced and the person would have to be immobilized in order to have healing of that. You can see here, this is why you should never lift really heavy weights like that. So another example of joint elbow dislocation. I don't have pictures of fractures. We'll be looking at those in a little bit. Oh, I do have a picture of a fracture. Here we go. We have um, a fracture of the head of the radius. This is one of the most commonly fractured bones in, in the upper extremity. And you can see there and there where the uh, fractures of the head, it kind of just looks like it's kind of cracked in different places. Again, after a fracture, the elbow would have to be immobilized. Usually the elbow is casted in a flexed posture. And of course, the problem with that is that flexion is the open pack position, extension is the closed pack. So after the period of immobilization, that connective tissue adapts to that shortened position, and then we, of course, are going to deal with some limitations in motion. Here's a humerus fracture that looks pretty serious. Uh, if we think back to the classifications of fractures that we talked about in the first unit, this is clearly displaced. The bones are not in alignment. And it's possible, it looks very likely on the right-hand side here, that it is also a compound fracture, which means, of course, that it's broken through the skin. This clearly would need to be surgically repaired. And again, the upper extremity would have to be immobilized during the healing process. Here's an example or a, um, of an illustration of a surgical repair. Remember what it's called when the fracture is all in lots of different pieces like this? Yep, comminuted. It's a comminuted fracture. And that's definitely one of those fractures we said frequently requires an ORIF. What does ORIF stand for? Right, open reduction internal fixation. So the open part is the surgery. So we open the person up and we place in metal or um, plates and screws wires to hold all these bony pieces together in contact so that they can be touching each other and allow healing. And again, after this type of surgery, the elbow would need to be immobilized for a period of time to allow for that healing. We look at a disease process that causes immobility. Rheumatoid arthritis is the example we're going to use. I'm going to touch very briefly on the disease process here with this lecture, and we're going to be going into it in, in great, much greater detail when we talk about the wrist and hand. Essentially, uh, rheumatoid arthritis is a systemic disease. It's an autoimmune disease. So if you remember what autoimmune means, it means that the body's own tissues are attacking themselves. And in this case, it's the connective tissue, in particular the synovial tissue that gets attacked. And so what happens is the synovium expands and proliferates, becomes very inflamed, and it encroaches upon the articular surface. And you can see then that it starts to break down the hyaline cartilage, which of course 
results in more bone on bone, and then we get the characteristic bone spurs. So there is a degenerative component to rheumatoid arthritis, but it starts out as an inflammatory autoimmune disease. Ultimately, the joint capsule be becomes thickened and inflamed through repetitive inflammation. It becomes very tight and stiff. We can have actually dislocation or disruption of the bony elements because of the destruction of the connective tissue. And all in all, that's going to lead to uh, definitely immobility of, of whatever the joint is involved. This is an x-ray view. And remember, whenever you look at an x-ray, we'll, we'll start up on top here, you, you would like to be able to see a nice smooth contour to the bone. But if we follow that contour down, you can see that it gets very fuzzy in here. And remember, in the, in the joint between the bones, we should see a nice clear joint, joint space in here, and we certainly don't see that. Um, on this bottom picture, we can definitely see how rough this is, and we get a little sense of osteophyte here on the top of the um, trochlea. Just kind of a big hot mess in here where there's just lots of extra bone kind of proliferating around, but it's really no clear identifiable joint, clear joint area. So it, I think it's obvious from a visual perspective that you're not going to have nice smooth motion in a joint that looks like this. And I don't have a picture, but uh, degenerative joint disease again would look very much like that. We don't see a lot of degenerative changes in the elbow per se, um, but it's possible to have that in, in any joint. So the motions that we would look at that would be limited would be our close pack positions, which would be elbow extension and forearm supination. So if we think about the activities that we do when we go into those motions, think about turning a door knob, opening a door with your right hand, that would require supination. Um, trying to push or pull things if you have limited motion in the elbow would be difficult. And carrying things, of course, and then just any types of ADLs, feeding, dressing, bathing activities would all be challenging with impaired range of motion in the elbow and forearm. With joint hypomobility, we don't really have the acute, subacute, and chronic phases of repair that we've traditionally talked about with soft tissue repair. Remember, there's been something bony going on when we're talking about a dislocation or a fracture. And in that case, the person's going to be immobilized until that bony tissue is healed enough to come out of the cast and be able to move around. The rheumatoid arthritis, there could be an acute type phase. And we would call that the maximum protection phase. It would be just like, we would be managing it just like the acute phase where we would do passive, active assisted, and active exercise within pain-free limits. For someone who's coming out of a cast, they would kind of go right into what we would call the controlled motion phase. Now this is analogous to the subacute phase, but it's not the same as the subacute phase in soft tissue healing because the time frames are different. So the controlled motion phase is when we would start our gentle passive stretching because, of course, we know the effects of immobilization on connective tissue are to weaken that tissue and to make it stiffer, so we have to be more gentle in how we apply, more conservative in how we apply stretching initially. Certainly active exercise would be fine. We can do resisted exercise, and we would encourage the person to start using that upper extremity with light functional activities, again, dressing and bathing type of activities. We don't want them probably going back to a, a work or a recreational situation where they're going through high force, high velocity type motions and contractions. But we certainly want to encourage normal use of the extremity to eat, grooming, bathing, and things like that. The last phase is called the return to function phase. So this might be what we would have thought about analogous in the soft tissue repair to the chronic phase of repair. So in the return to function phase, it's just that. We certainly want them to return to their full activities. We would progress their stretching to be more vigorous, to restore full range of motion, and progress their resistance exercise to restore them to full, ex to full strength. We're going to move on now to the overuse syndromes. And there are two that I'm going to discuss in relationship to the elbow and form, and those are lateral and medial epicondylitis. And I'm going to define and describe the cause and the biomechanical contributions to each of those disorders separately. 
and then we're going to deal with management as a group or together. We'll start with lateral epicondylitis, and of course you already know that the muscles that attach to the lateral epicondyle of the humerus are generally the wrist extensors. And we know that when we have an itis, it means inflammation. So pretty logically we're talking about an inflammation of the tendons as they attach into the lateral epicondyle. So it's an inflammation, it's essentially a tendonitis of the wrist extensors. The most commonly involved one is the extensor carpi radialis brevis, but we can also see involvement of the extensor carpi radialis longus and, and sometimes the extensor carpi ulnaris. Cause of this is repetitive or excessive use generally of the wrist extensors. And we'll look at some of the um, types of activities that can contribute to that. Given its name, it's also called tennis elbow. And you can see here this excellent form for this person doing this backhand. Um, if, the per if the backhand is improper, if there's a lot of wrist motion, and I'm sure Adam can tell us that when you're playing tennis, you're not supposed to be moving your wrist around. It's supposed to be stable. It's not like playing racquetball or badminton where the wrist is moving a lot. And remember that the person here is gripping this tennis racket really tightly so that they can manage the forces here. So it's not just that the person's um, doing their backhand incorrectly by moving the wrist, but even if they're doing it correctly, the fact that they're gripping, remember, is going to activate the wrist extensors. We always activate the wrist extensors to stabilize the wrist and prevent active insufficiency of the finger flexors, and we have to stabilize. So the harder someone's gripping, and the more often they're doing that, the more you're going to be working these wrist extensors. And if we overwork them, we can develop some chronic inflammation, and that's what we see here with lateral epicondylitis. Another issue, uh, or another cause, as you can see here, is doing something like weeding. And you can see here how, how tightly her hands are gripped. So you're gripping something that's pretty small and kind of slippery, and so it requires what we call overgripping. And again, we see this as an issue where people are using excessive gripping forces. You see that over here where this guy is doing some meat cutting. You can tell this meat's probably slippery, he's having to stabilize it, and he's having to hold pretty tightly to this knife as he's taking it through the cutting motions. So these are um, examples of types of activities that can cause lateral epicondylitis. So even though we call it tennis elbow, it's certainly not unique to that. Other activities could be raking or weaving type of activities. And now let's look at medial epicondylitis and probably no surprise to you, it's inflammation of the muscles that attach to the medial epicondyle. And you should recall that those are the wrist flexors and also uh, the forearm pronators, particularly um, pronator teres as we just looked at before. And I like this kind of cutout here because it shows the consequence of having repetitive inflammation in a connective tissue structure. So the connective tissue is, is damaged or strained or sprained, and it undergoes the classic acute, subacute, and chronic repair process. What's unfortunate about overuse syndromes is that they frequently recur. And so you have here then the situation where you have repetitive reinflammation of this tissue. And every time that it has to go through the healing process, remember that collagen tissue gets laid down, usually in kind of crisscross patterns, it doesn't always get mobilized and stretched out so that it's nice and healthy and perfect again. And so we tend to get thickened, less flexible tissue. Well, guess what? That predisposes the person to having it become inflamed even more readily again. And so you do see people with these chronic inflammatory overuse conditions. We'll be talking um, shortly about the types of body mechanics and and activity modifications that we're going to suggest and help people make to try to prevent those, those um, flare-ups. So the cause of medial epicondylitis is, of course, repetitive or overuse of their wrist flexors and pronators. Now, it's also called golfer's elbow, so let's look at this golfer. I don't know if any of you are golfers in the group, but when you're golfing, you're not supposed to flex your wrist. So we see kind of that wrist motion issue again. So you can see as the person comes up through the backswing, and then they're, as they come down, as they're accelerating the club down 
to hit the ball, that's where that forceful use of the wrist flexors is going to come in. And it's during this period that they're supposed to keep the wrist nice and straight. Now, he has excellent form here. So there's actually a little product on the market to help people keep their wrist nice and straight so that they are not um, overusing those muscles. So I just thought, I don't play golf, but I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, other times where you may see other um, athletic endeavors in which you might see overuse is, is during swimming. And so by, especially during the backstroke, as they're supposed to come down, if they have an improper backstroke, and again, they're flexing the wrist instead of using the motion from the shoulder to get more power, you could see that. Um, lifting heavy items could also be a time when we might see a person developing medial epicondylitis. I will say that lateral epicondylitis is far, far more common, and it's because of the fact that we have to grip to do lots of activities. So remember, when we grip, we use the wrist extensors. That activates those wrist extensors, and if we overuse them, we're going to see much more commonly lateral epicondylitis. So we'll go on and talk about the impairments. And again, these are common. Uh, we'll just try to distinguish if we're talking about medial or lateral epicondylitis. But common impairments, um, pain is an impairment certainly, so gradually increasing pain. It'll be around the elbow area, even though it's after use of the wrist or hand. We certainly can see decreased grip strength and tenderness at either the insertion of the lateral, at the lateral epicondyle where the wrist extensors are inserting, originating, or the medial epicondyle where the wrist flexors are originating, depending on if we're talking about medial or lateral epicondylitis. Now remember, a functional, uh, an impairment is something we can measure like strength, range of motion, flexibility, balance. A functional impairment is the task that that impairment makes more difficult. So a functional impairment or a functional limitation, I apologize, for medial or lateral epicondylitis will be having difficulty doing those tasks. So I think I've mentioned before, I sometimes get lateral epicondylitis when I've been doing a lot of gardening. So if I go out one day and I'm pulling a lot of weeds, if I go out another day or two later, try to pull more weeds, it's more difficult because that has already been aggravated and so now that same activity is, is difficult. Certainly in sports we see people who have um, a lot of frustration and trouble because they want to participate in their sport activity and the pain from the inflammation that they have is preventing that from occurring. Um, finally, we can definitely see interference with work-related type activities if somebody's, again, a meat cutter, um, works as a gardener or a landscaper and, and is not able to participate fully in work activities. So what can we do to help? Well, one of the things that we can do um, while we, to protect the tissue but still allow function is um, called a counterforce brace. And, and remember, in the acute phase, we do want to protect the tissue, but it, we don't want to immobilize the entire body or the entire person. So what we can do is allow the person to continue using the wrist and hand, but yet protect the forces from impacting and pulling on the attachment site. So we see here this brace it, it straps very tightly around the forearm, just distal to either the medial or lateral epicondyle. And same type of brace can be used equally for either one. And the idea is instead of, you know, the insertion point here, since you can see the lateral epicondyle, we'll talk about it that way. Instead of the, the origin here of the wrist extensors and the lateral epicondyle, it kind of functionally moves it down here. So as the person is using the wrist and hand and gripping, it makes the most of the force kind of stop here where the strap is and then the part of the tendon between the strap and the actual bony attachment is protected from a lot of that force so the force kind of stops here at the strap so that's why it's called counter force it creates a, a counter attachment if you will and again people then can then continue to work and do the functional activities they need to do with and still protect the inflamed area Another type of brace is called a wrist cock-up brace um, because it, it cocks or puts the person up into extension 
and this one looks a this has um, been kind of custom made. You can see it's kind of made out of that plastic material that you heat up in the water. Um, this one is a more conventional one that you can get. We have a couple in the lab, so you'll get to play with those when you do lab. And essentially, it keeps the wrist in a relatively functional position of about 20 to 30 degrees of extension um, and, and allows the fingers to be free so the fingers can be used, but yet it immobilizes the wrist so the wrist extensors don't have to function the brace keeps the wrist in extension. Um, that type of brace is, again, it's very important to wear that during the activity, but also a lot of people find comfort uh, wearing that at night, not allowing their wrist and hand to get into awkward positions. But we definitely, during the acute phase, want to use these during functional activities, during work activities, to allow the person to maintain activity, but still protect the tissue. And while the wrist cock-up splint was probably designed originally for lateral epicondylitis, it certainly can be a form of that, like this Velcro one can be used for medial epicondylitis as well. It does immobilize the wrist, prevents wrist flexion, and protects that tissue. Of course, we always know that during the acute phase we can do passive, active-assisted, and active exercise, as long as it's within what? Right, pain-free limits. And we want to make sure that we're keeping the rest of the arm strong so we can do resisted exercise uh, to the shoulder and the scapular muscles because the person may not be quite as active as they normally would be so we don't want them to lose strength there. Um, and one other thing we can do is cross friction massage and even in the acute phase we can start this as long as it's gentle and it's tolerated by the patient. And the idea is that we're trying to kind of keep those little collagen fibers separate in the tendon so that they don't create adhesions. You can just see here the little illustration of extensor carpi radialis brevis, which is kind of the main culprit in lateral epicondylitis. Do you remember what EDC would stand for? Extensor digitorum communis, right. And then, of course, this would be extensor carpi radialis longus. As we move into the subacute and chronic stages of repair, we certainly can add stretching and resistance exercise. So let's think a little bit about stretching. We want to be as precise as we can with stretching the, the wrist extensors and the wrist flexors. So let's take the extensors to start with. If we're thinking about stre stretching extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis, we certainly would want to flex the wrist, but we also want to think about the other actions. Since it crosses the elbow, it it actually crosses anteriorly to the joint axis, so it's um, going to need to be stretched by putting the elbow in extension. And then remember that some of the wrist extensors can cause supination, so we would want the forearm in pronation. So why don't you do that? Straighten out your elbow, make sure your forearm is in pronation, and then with your other hand, push your wrist down into flexion. So that's your stretch. How long would you hold that? Right, 15 to 30 seconds, very good. Now, how about wrist flexors? So they, of course, are attached to the medial epicondyle. They also cross the elbow, so we need to put that the elbow in extension again. But many of the wrist flexors do pronation, so why don't you put your elbow into extension, form supination, and then, with your other hand, take your wrist into extension. Now you're stretching out your wrist flexors. 15 to 30 seconds, very good. Cross friction massage continues into the subacute and chronic stages and it gets much more vigorous and at this stage it, it can be a little bit uncomfortable but usually that's really important. Remember at the beginning of the lecture I mentioned that one of the reasons for recurrence is that the collagen gets, um, adhesions occur between the collagen, it's cross-linked and there's never a point where somebody uses the cross friction massage to separate the fibers and the stretching to realign them. So these are two important elements of the intervention program that really need to go together. We often teach the patient to do their own cross friction massage, of course, as well as doing their stretching. As far as resistance exercises, often we begin with isometrics just because it's a little um, easier to do and it's less uncomfortable, but we can certainly progress to concentric and eccentric and 
Certainly for those we can use manual resistance. We can use those little dumbbells like we have in, in the lab. We can use TheraBand. Those are very easy ways to do resistance exercise. The one thing you have to be a little cautious with with an overuse syndrome is to make sure that you don't progress, don't start too vigorously and don't progress too quickly because we don't want to create a flare-up. So just as we're trying to get people gradually to resume functional activities, we need to be cautious. So you still want to stay with your 10 rep max, um, but you need to make sure that the exercise, the resistance exercise, isn't painful. And that's the balancing act. Often we um, use modalities to try to manage some of that inflammation. So we may do some, in the subacute and chronic phases, we may be using some heat modalities for exercise to limber the muscle up, to make it less likely to um, have tension on it because it's more pliable. And then, of course, after exercise, we could also do, always do some cryotherapy. A couple other activities. We, we could do some exercises that actually mimic the activity the person wants to resume. So in particular, we would do this with sports activities. So we might have them bring their golf club in or um, any other activity they're doing, and we could um, simulate that activity, watch their mechanics. And then remember plyometrics. Plyometrics are when you have uh, eccentric loading followed by a quick concentric contraction. And we could do that easily for the wrist flexors by having the person toss a weighted ball. You know, you, I know you've seen those, those small weighted balls we have in class. Um, and you can always use TheraBand for both the flexors and the extensors. So remember, we do plyometrics toward the end of the rehab session where the, when the person can take faster, more vigorous, more powerful types of contractions. So that really wraps it up for the interventions uh, from a physical therapy standpoint. If someone really has recalcitrant epicondylitis, there is a surgical repair that can be done. And essentially they go in and kind of shift, they take out any excessive scar tissue and you can see in C and in D they're kind of clipping back some of that excessive scar tissue um, and then kind of reattaching the tendon in a better mechanical position. I don't know how commonly this is done. I've certainly never seen a patient with it, but I, this is not an area of expertise of mine, but certainly not a surgery, surgery that you hear a lot about. But there is one, and I just wanted to share it with you. So at this point, we're all done with the second section where we talked about disorders, and then you'll want to go to the final video on physical examination.